There's an additional issue with pornography, which is not often discussed, which is that, remember, guys in particular, the brain is a learning prediction machine. And if, I'm not trying to say that all pornography is bad, but there are good data to support the idea that if your brain learns to be aroused by watching other people have sex, it is not necessarily going to carry over to the ability to get aroused when you're one-on-one -on -one with somebody else, right? The, it, especially young kids who are consuming a lot of pornography, the brain is learning sexual arousal to other people having sex. So you're going to program yourself into being a voyeur. Or, yeah, or just create challenges in, in sexual interactions with, uh, you know, with, with peer, uh, with a with a real partner. Right? Mary Harrington has the three laws of porno dynamics and the second law of porno dynamics is the law of fap entropy. And it says that whatever you start out wanking to will get progressively more intense over time. And I think that this is sort of speaking to that ever, ever sort of escalating amount of um, the wildness that you need to watch in order to get an ever decreasing stimulus that comes back. Yeah. And you know, here I'm, I'm approaching this only through the lens of biology, right? I'm not a, you know, I'm not a psychologist and I'm certainly not um, political in it in any way. At least not, I have ideas about politics, but I just don't discuss them publicly. But the, but the idea here is that, you know, I'm not saying pornography as a stimulus is bad or good. What I'm saying is it in its availability and its extreme forms, it's a very potent stimulus and very potent stimuli of any kind, extremely palatable food, extreme pornography, um, extreme experiences like bungee cord jumping, those set a threshold for dopamine release. And Anna will tell you that, and I'm sure she did, that the higher the dopamine peak, the bigger the drop afterwards. And it's not that you drop to baseline, you drop below baseline. So again, it's not, these things aren't good or bad. They just have to be controlled in a way because when people are pursuing dopamine peaks over and over and over and they aren't getting them, typically it's because they've been pursuing that activity far too often. And you're saying perhaps take a break from that and there may be uh, an ability for yourself, your system to reset. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, in theory, all the things that we're talking about with pornography could be superimposed onto food or could be superimposed onto real sex, right? Um, that one also has to be cautious there, right? But the cycling back and forth between dopamine and low dopamine states, dopamine fasting as it were, but maybe just low dopamine states. These are natural rhythms that exist in the nervous system. We have to remember what the dopaminergic system is there for. I'll say it again. I wasn't consulted at the design phase, but we know as a, as a generic form of motivation and pursuit, you can imagine the human or the animal that's hungry or thirsty. It needs energy to go pursue the thing. So the idea that you have to eat in order to get energy, that's true, but you need energy in order to get the thing to eat. So our nervous system has energy also, that's dopamine and epinephrine. Yes, we use glucose and glycogen, et cetera, when we're pursuing things, but the idea here is you're pursuing something and then either by smell or by sight, you think you're on the right track. So you go down that track and then, ah, there it is. You know, you get some berries or you get, you know, let's get prehistoric about this, or you get to kill the prey and eat it and then it gives you energy to continue this pursuit or to reproduce i mean there's a reason why humans and other animals seek out reproduction is that every every species but certainly humans have two innate desires built into them whether or not they decide to actualize this or not is the desire to protect young and make more of its own species every successful species does that even if people don't have children in general people care about children because they of what they represent very few people dislike children i mean there are a few mutants out there that dislike children but you always worry about those kinds of people vincent asks uh why is pornography bad Oof! why is pornography bad pornography is bad for one simple reason and that is that you are getting false dopamine hits from doing something that makes you feel guilty and gives you shame if you look at this uh all of you can Google vibration chart. Like all of us have a vibration. Everything in, in life has a vibration. In fact, there's a, there's a true story. There was a bridge in Baltimore that was built like in the 60s. Dude, it's crazy. And the way they built the bridge, etc., it had the same vibrational frequency as wind at 22 miles an hour, right? So when wind kicked up to 22 miles an hour, that 22 mile an hour wind and the vibrational status of that bridge 
were in line and this bridge would start vibrating and shaking and swaying and cars were getting like tossed around oh, yeah. they had to demolish that whole bridge and rebuild it vibrations real like you've been around people you walk in you meet them and immediately you feel this weird like low energy like right. you're just sucking out the energy of the room right yep. that's a low frequency person mm -hmm. right and you've been around high frequency people and so if you look up the frequency chart or vibrational chart of humans you'll see that guilt and shame are at the very bottom and they rank at like vibration level like five and six right in the middle is acceptance acceptance that i'm going to accept that i'm a flawed human but i'm going to take action in becoming a better human that's vibrational level 400. at the very top of that pyramid of frequency or vibration is self-actualization happiness fulfillment gratitude that is a vibration level of 12 to 1400 okay. in terms of frequency right. right and so when you are watching porn you're getting dopamine hits and those dopamine hits you're conditioning yourself okay when i do something shameful and that i feel guilty about i get dopamine hits oh my god i do not want to get this awesome great dopamine hit that's supposed to be good for me mm -hmm. like working out that's a dopamine hit. Right. Making love to your spouse, that's a good dopamine hit, right? Um, doing a hard day's work and feeling accomplished, that's a good dopamine hit. Watching porn secretly because you don't want to be found because you'll feel guilt and shame and getting a dopamine hit, you're conditioning yourself to get dopamine out of negativity, negative things, number one. Number two, guilt and shame are very low on the frequency chart. So you just feel like a low vibrating human and you attract low bad negative stuff into your life and number three and this is recently has recently been found in the last 12 months 12 to 14 months there's something called porn induced erectile dysfunction mm -hmm. porn induced erectile dysfunction so there used to be a time that people were starting to get impotent or would have erectile dysfunction in their 40s and 50s and 60s as they get older right right now young kids teens kids in their 20s and their 30s are are unable to get an erection and have sex because they're so used to watching a porn scene that is so exaggerated mm -hmm. so over the top that has released so much intense dopamines when you're watching the threesome foursome gangbangs whatever the fuck it is that you weirdos are into <laughs> and I don't judge you I've been down that path but I stopped but when you're into that shit and then you come home to your beautiful spouse and you just have to make love to her, you're like, well, I don't know, man. Like, it's not eight of you <laughs> on top of each other with weird tools and gadgets and a swing and a, and a, and right. a ball gag from Pulp Fiction, <laughs> right? Shout out to Quentin Tarantino and Pulp Fiction. You know what I'm talking about, Maine. By the way, Ed's not here today. Maine's got the, Maine's got the cameras. And so... Uh, Fuck, bro, how are you going to be able to make sweet love to your wife if you can't get hard because you've got porn-induced impotence? Yeah. That's sad. So that is why pornography is absolutely bad for you. Well, what about the people that... Because I know there's going to be comments, people like, oh, well, he's one of those guys that's just anti-whatever. What about the people that ask, okay, what if I just do it every once in a while? Like, I'm not addicted. I could stop whenever I want. What do you say to those people? Hey, guess what? If you're not addicted and you're not getting any of the negative side effects, this is a free country. Go for it. I'm not your daddy. I will give you fatherly advice on the show, but I'm not your daddy. I'm not your God. I'm not anyone other than some guy on YouTube and ended with a podcast who lives an awesome life, who is congruent with his core values, who has been down all the weird paths of all the different vices that these guys are, have gone down. And I'm telling you right now, they have designed pornography where even a little bit becomes a lot. Mm -hmm. Because then you want the next, you want the next, you want the next. Then you realize that, holy crap, I'm addicted. It's just like a vape pen. It's like, oh, I only take a hit here and I take a hit there. And then you see the dudes on a plane who are fiending for a hit from a vape pen because they've been on a three-hour flight and they can't wait to just run out of that terminal and take yeah. a hit of their vape pen. Right. I don't ever want anything to enslave my mind and heart that way. Not, mm -hmm. not pornography not nicotine not alcohol not food not television not any addiction out there not gambling gambling mm -hmm. will create such an addictive component to it none of it not 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 even money like money is very intoxicating as well right 
But money is something we need and you can learn to be good and generous with money. But you can also start getting so addicted to it that you can start doing illegal things that are outside of your core values and character mm -hmm. and justify it by, well, I'm just making money and doing good with it until you end up in jail. Plenty of great, nice, good people are in jail because they made bad decisions and it was the addictive factor. Right. So if people are like, hey man, look, porn doesn't affect me. I, I just do it occasionally just to let off some steam. Listen, I got no beef with you, but I'm just letting you know that those companies that produce porn have designed it to take you down the rabbit hole and hold you there for as long as they could. Mm -hmm. I also heard a quote too, I don't, I'm gonna butcher it, but it basically was, if someone's asking, can I just do it in moderation, whatever the addiction is, whatever the thing is, if you have to do it in moderation, you're still a slave to it because you, couldn't, you can't even stop. Exactly. You still have to do it a little bit. So anyways, there's that. Very the downtown east side of Vancouver, British Columbia is one of the world's ground zeros for addiction. And that in a few square block radius, we have thousands of people injecting, inhaling and ingesting drugs of all kinds and paying dearly for it. These people are often outside the law, certainly beset by many medical problems due to injection drug use, including psychosis, including HIV, including hepatitis C, cancers, they die of overdoses. This is trench warfare and the people that are the frontline soldiers dying from it are the people affected by addiction. So that's where I worked for 12 years. And um, what I learned could be summed up really very uh, briefly by saying that addiction is not a choice that anybody makes, it's not a moral failure, it's not an ethical lapse, it's not a weakness of character, it's not a failure of will, it's just how our society depicts addiction, nor is it an inherited brain disease, which is how the medical tendency is to see it, but it actually is it's a response to human suffering. And all these people that I worked with had been severely traumatized as children. All the women had been sexually abused, all the men had been uh, traumatized, some of them sexually, physically, emotionally neglected. And not only is that my perspective, it's also what the scientific and research literature shows. So addiction then is actually rather than being a disease as such or a human choice, it actually is its an attempt to escape suffering temporarily. By the time I, I went to work there, I had already been in family practice for 20 years. I'd seen a lot and I was quite attuned to the impact of early childhood experiences on adult psychology and adult brain physiology. But I just hadn't seen the depth and the degree until I went to work down there. So really it dramatized and confirmed for me, made it very palpable how addictions are a response to suffering and that what people need in response to addiction is not judgment and not simply symptom control. They need to be helped to heal from their trauma because it is all about trauma. The media, the television, cultural depiction of addicts is usually as desperate people but without showing why they're desperate. So all the shows is the desperation for the drugs. Uh, there's no indication of what's driving that desperation. And hence you see them behaving in all kinds of dysfunctional ways. Aggressive or manipulative or uh, unpleasant. But again, there's no three-dimensional sense of the reality of these people as to what that's really all about for them. Is it possible to cure people? You're speaking from the Western model where I am the expert and you're the one with the disease and I'm going to cure you. Uh, like you cure a piece of meat, you know? No. The answer to that question framed that way is no, it's not possible. If you're asking, is it possible for people to heal from trauma sufficiently that they don't have to keep escaping into addictions to lessen the suffering of their trauma? Yes, that's entirely possible. But the question is, under what conditions is that possible? And under the conditions that obtain in London, UK, or Vancouver, British Columbia, or in New York, New York, or any place under the conditions that are obtained socially, legally, and from the perspective of medical practice, it's hardly a likelihood because we're approaching it from the wrong direction and with the wrong perspective. If I could constantly demonstrate that with this particular population, I could affect a 5 or 10% success rate of getting people to leave the addiction behind. I'd be considered to be a genius. 
because our results are so poor. When I say ours, I don't mean ours specifically in Vancouver. I don't mean that. I mean the overall treatment model for addiction is so poor in succeeding with the most affected segments of the population. So, I mean, addictions are like everything else on a spectrum. So a lot of people do heal from addictions, but the most inveterate, most entrenched addicts, they have the hardest time. And they're also the ones whom society gives the hardest time so that it makes it even harder to help them. Never mind they don't get the help they need, they actually get actively punished. And so what you've actually got is traumatized children, and children are traumatized, that affects how they feel about themselves, which is deeply ashamed, because the child always believes that it's about himself. So if, if I'm being hurt like this, I gotta be a terrible person. Or if I was sexually abused, why didn't I fight back? I must be a very weak person. So there's a deep sense of shame. Then there's tremendous emotional pain that accrues from abuse and neglect. Tremendous emotional pain that is hardly possible for people to bear. Now they have to soothe their pain with substances or the compulsive behaviors. Then the trauma itself, given that the human brain develops an interaction with the environment, shapes the brain circuitry in such a way that the person will be more likely to find relief from the drugs. So the very physiology of the brain is affected by early trauma. So then you take these traumatized people and you make their habit illegal. It's not illegal to drink yourself to death. It's not illegal to make yourself sick with emphysema or lung cancer by means of cigarettes. But it's illegal to use other substances. So now you take these abused, traumatized people, you take them outside the law, you put them in jails, and you harm them all their lives treating them like criminals and bad people and, and failures and rejects and less than human. And then we wonder how come they don't get better. So it's a self-perpetuating cycle of taking traumatized people and then re-traumatizing them and then hoping at the same time, why don't they listen? Why don't they get better already? Why don't they give it up? Well, they don't give it up because the more hurt they are, the more they need to escape. In other words, the addiction wasn't your problem. Your problem was that you had a lot of emotional pain, you didn't know what to do with. So the addiction was really an attempt to solve a problem. So when you say, why do people use substances or why do they engage in addictions in general, it's because they have a problem they don't know what to do with. And if you really understand their addiction, we have to ask, well, what gave you so much emotional pain? And how come you didn't have the internal resources? This is not a judgment, it's simply an inquiry. How come you lacked, at some point, the internal resources to deal with that pain in a more creative, forward-looking way that would help you resolve the pain rather than to perpetuate it? So really, really what it was is that the addiction came along to help you solve a problem you had no other solutions for at the time. And that's the case for all addictions. So why do people use? Why do people engage in addictions? Because they have deep emotional problems they don't have the means to resolve on their own. That's why they use. The average medical student until very recently, has never even heard the word trauma in their education. It doesn't show up. We don't talk about it. We don't talk about its impact on the brain, on the personality, on, on, on the emotional life of people, on its impact on people's physical health. It's not a word that we mention. We're traumaphobic. As a fellow doctor said to me, the medical profession is traumaphobic. Psychiatrists these days are trained mostly in this biological model of psychiatry where everything comes down to a biological brain disease. Here, let's give you a pill. The last thing most psychiatrists know how to talk about is actually emotional pain or its origins in human experience. You would think they'd know how to do that, but they don't. They're not trained in it. It's not part of the predominant medical ideology. And, you know, as a physician, I can tell you, we like to think of medicals as a science, and it has certainly great scientific achievements uh, to its credit and great scientific insights to buttress its successes. But it's as much as ideology as a science. And ideology has certain hidden assumptions that are hidden from the people that believe in ideology. And so that if something is excluded by your ideology, you just won't see it. And so that you can be talking to somebody about your addiction and the simple question, what did they do for you? And how come you're in so much emotional pain? It doesn't occur to anybody. 
you know, trained in the classical manner. Now, this is true not just for physicians, it's true for a lot of psychologists as well, who are more interested in solving your problems and getting you to overcome the behavior than in asking, well, okay, where does behavior come from? And what are you still carrying inside that's making you behave that way? And how can we help you resolve what's inside you? Not just how do we help you change your behavior, but how do we help you change? Now that's what healing is. And that happens inside a person. So it's never a question of anybody curing anybody else. But we can guide people to healing if we ask the right questions. That's not nothing. That's something. And to think that doesn't do anything to you, it's like, no, that, that's, that likely does something to you. What would you say are, are, are things that men to, need to be focusing in on when it's trying to select a woman for a long-term marriage partner? Well, you want someone honest. That's really, really important. Someone who will, who will do her best to tell you, tell the truth. And my wife swore she'd do that before we got married, and, and she has. Probably better than I have. And so that's, that's a rock, man, at the bottom of things, you know. So that's, and you can't underplay the role of sexual attraction. And that's a mysterious thing. And so that's, that's crucial as far as I'm concerned. And, and can't be so just, I have a real you know, question about yep. that, Jordan Peterson, Dr. Peterson. So you mentioned pornography, and we do countless pieces of content to be able to help young men overcome that issue and provide a tons of resources to help them support them. So what I've noticed that happens sometimes is because of years of watching pornography, the men's sexual attraction becomes warped. And so what, how can a man whose sexual attraction to women has become warped to the extreme ends due to uh, um, so much cons consumption of pornography, how can that man go back to now uh, being attracted to, you know, more natural looking women or more women that could be around their, you know, their, their lives instead of the, the, the projected- Well, deprivation you know, is helpful, yeah. you know, I mean, so I think it's reasonable to assume that there's an a novelty edge in pornography like there is in so many quasi-addictive phen phenomena and so it has to become because it because novelty is a sexual kick it has to stay novel and that means that over time it's going to become more extreme so that's not good well so how do you resensitize yourself in some sense well you stop you stop and then hopefully you recover and then you deprive yourself of that outlet, let's say. And you might say, well, you know, is, is that absolutely necessary? And maybe there's nothing wrong with pornography. It's like, well, I don't know, man. Like, have you ever really met a guy who is proud of that? Like, you know what I mean? That makes him feel like I'm the guy, man. Uh, you know, I'm watching pornography and getting off. It's like, what a man. I don't believe anyone feels that. And to me, maybe I'm wrong. Um, and to me, that's an indication that, yeah, we know. No, it's pretty cheap. It's cheap. It's easy. And, you know, I say that knowing that I believe the research evidence shows that if you introduce pornography into a community, that rate, rates of sexual crime committed by men upon women actually decline. So there is perhaps some utility in the outlet. But, you know, that's a unidimensional analysis and doesn't take into account all the other effects of pornography yeah. so including the ones you described and i think that those are real it makes sense that they're real you know because it's super satiation and and it's a, and it's it's a non-trivial technological problem you know it's now possible for a young men to look at more beautiful nude women in one day than any man has ever seen you know prior to 10 years ago 20 years ago than any man in history had ever seen that's not yeah. nothing that's something and to think that doesn't do anything to you, it's like, no, that, that's, that likely does something to you.
So don't substitute the, the false for the real. And, and don't underestimate the utility of deprivation. You know, you do, what, what do we need to drive us forward to have the adventure of our life? You know, well, some, dep some deprivation, that's for sure, that, that uh, heightens desire and drive. And maybe you need that. You're afraid to approach a woman. Well, you remove part of your drive with pornography. And so now you don't have that sexual urge to overcome that anxiety. And so you stay timid for your entire life. You know, maybe not, but, but maybe. So with 12 Rules for Life and also with Beyond Order, you, 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 you've, you've amassed so many amazing rules that um, I just think it's just so phenomenal. One of my favorites is Rule 4 and 12 Rules for Life. You know, don't compare yourself to others. Mm -hmm. Where others are today, compare yourself to who you were yesterday. And so in your opinion, obviously, you know, there's so many rules that are great. But what do you think is probably if, if, if somebody was to read those books and there's one rule that you like, this rule, of the 24 I've given you over these past few um, years, I, you can absolutely not get this one wrong. Which rule would that be? Tell the truth or at least mm. don't lie. Because you can't tell the truth, right? Because who are you to tell the truth? That's a, that's a mighty tall order, man. But you can stop mm. saying things that you know are lies and that will change your life if you do that. Mm. And it's crucial. Why would it change their life? Well, how can you adapt to reality when you falsify it? And you mm. think, well, I'm just lying to other people. It's no, no, you're not. You can't just lie to other people because what you say becomes you, especially if you practice it. Because we build ourselves out of words. And that can be lies in action, too. It's like, don't, don't say things you know to be false. That's a, that's a good start, man. And it allies yourself with the truth. And that, like, how can that be a bad idea? Ma imagine that what is true reflects reality, which is sort of the definition of true. How can mm. failing to align yourself with reality work? How is that possibly going to work? Well, you say, well, I can, you know, if I lie, I get away with something. It's like, no, you don't. You, I, I tell you, I swear this is true. In all of my clinical practice, I have never, ever seen anyone ever get away with anything even once. You mm. think the chickens won't come home to roost. It's like, all that that means is you're too stupid to see what your lies cause, or too blind or too self-deceptive. You just don't see it. And so you don't get away with anything, nothing. It's terrifying to, to actually understand that. It's terrifying. What if you can't get away with anything ever, you know? Well, that's the judgmental God, fundamentally. That's a very old idea, and it's an old idea for a reason. And of course you can't get away with anything, because imagine that you took a, a flexible plastic comb, you know, and you bent it backwards, and you say, well, I got away with that. It's like, well, what's going to happen when you let go? It's going to snap back and hit you in the face, and that's, that's life, man. You warp the structure of reality? You think you are someone who can warp the structure of reality with your words and get away with it? Really? No, man, that should, that should terrify you right to the core of your soul. You're not God. You can't do so that. Dr. Peterson, you said that you've never seen someone get away with lying Anything. what do you mean by that because I, I can imagine if somebody listening to this right now who said well I've, I haven't told the truth and I, and I got away with plenty of things in my past what do you mean by yeah, that and everything is right in your life everything is just the way you want it to be that's how it is is it <laughs> yeah sure and good if, if, if find someone like that great but I've never seen anyone like that and psychopaths mm -hmm. you know they have no conscience they lie all the time well how do they get away with it they don't they have to move because people figure out who they are and then they have to move on. And so you could say, well, that's getting away with it. It's like, well, no, no, no long term relationships, no love, no trust, no, no, no brotherly affection, no friends, you know, and generally no financial success, not in the real sense. How is that getting away with it? And then you might say, well, I've got away with it so far. It's like maybe you have. 
And maybe you're just too dim to see the consequences because you've blinded yourself and God only knows who you could have been if you wouldn't have lied your way to where you are now. No, it's, I, I, I've never seen it. And you know, sometimes I'd work with someone to untangle what had happened to them over multiple years as things fell apart. And we'd find all sorts of lies not always ones they told, but sometimes lies their parents told them, for example, that deep, dark, terrible things, you know, messing things up in an unbelievably catastrophic and tragic way. You know, it was absolutely terrifying. But I can't see how it just doesn't make sense. It's like, how could you possibly defend the idea that you could warp the structure of reality and get away with it? I mean, who, who like I said, who do you think you are? Reality is... You don't mess with it, like, it kills you. And it'll torture you quite a lot before doing that if you're not, if you're un particularly unlucky. So beware, you know, they say that fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. That's that judgmental God. You violate your conscience, man. You will pay. That's hell. Yeah. No, that's yeah. that's really powerful, and I and I love the medical physical representation that you talk about throughout your books because I think that's something really big in today's world where a lot of a lot of individuals, you know, there there's a fear of societal consequences, and they don't speak the truth and they lie. Yeah. But their spirit and their souls are being torn apart on the inside, and though they appear to be getting away with it at, when they sleep at night, they just know that they're not being their authentic selves and they know they're living a lie. Yeah, well, and they get weaker as, as you, you become what you practice. You know? And if you withdraw and lie, you become, some, you become a lying coward. That's what happens. You don't have to practice that much before that's the case. So is that what you want? You know, well, no one will get, no one will come after me. It's, yes, they will. Part of it is also realizing, really understanding in some way that there's no escape. You know? There's no safe path. There's a noble path. There's an honorable path. There's no safe path. And possibly you wouldn't want that anyways, because, well, who are you exactly, you know? Look at you, you know? Warrior stock. Every single one of your ancestors has stayed alive for three and a half billion years. It's like, good work, man. That's a lot. And so, what makes you so sure you're built for safety? What mm. makes you so sure that that's what we should strive for? And then if you want adventure, I'll tell you an adventure or what an adventure is. You tell the truth as nearly as you can and you'll have the adventure of your life. That's <laughs> for sure. So, you know, and that isn't, that isn't trying to fit in because you're naive or, you know, because you're too afraid to lie. That doesn't make you telling the truth. If you're too afraid to lie, that's, you know, in, in a cowardly sort of way. There's a wise way of being too afraid to lie. Yeah. So, yeah. and I knew, I thought too, you know, when I looked into atrocity deeply, and I looked into it for 15 years, meditated on the human capacity for atrocity. It was pretty awful. It was awful, you know, reading those stories of what happened in the Nazi concentration camps and what happened in, well, everywhere. And then trying to think about what you'd have to be like to do that and then thinking it through. It's awful. And that was, it was doing that, I realized all that was tangled up with lies. And so that's part of this issue of male power. You know, how do you keep male power noble and virtuous with the truth? It's mm. lies that turn competence into tyranny.